Okay. All right, thank you all for uh, for coming tonight. Uh, we've got a pretty good crowd. Looks like we've got about a little over 20 people. Uh, so we had a lot of interest in the last organic um, presentation that I did earlier this month. We talked about how to identify nutrient deficiencies in plants and how to treat them organically. So we get, you know, some people that, that call and, and they have questions about that. Um, but most of the questions we get are on organic pesticides. People are very aware of synthetic pesticides and they think that um, going completely organic is a great thing. And uh, there's a lot of misnomers about or treating pests organically in your garden. Uh, some people think that you can use whatever you know, is labeled organic and it's perfectly safe, um, no problems at all. You can spray it on your kids or your pets and, and you're fine and that's actually not the case. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about organic pest control, uh, kind of what it means, the differences between synthetic pest control, uh, different types of classifications of pest, pesticides, uh, and then we're going to kind of dive in and we'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, probably more popular or the favorited um, organic pest controls that you're going to see available in big box stores or, um, you know, online, Amazon, that kind of thing. And then finally, we're going to dive into some garden pests, mostly what you're probably going to see around here and how you would treat those garden pests organically so that you you feel like you actually have a toolbox of um of things that you can follow so that you you actually feel like you know what you're doing um and that's what we're aiming to do here is kind of try to break this down into something that's very usable and easy to follow there's going to be just like last time a lot of information there will be qr codes that are associated with quite a few of the slides here some of it's on research for publications. Um, some of it's going to be fact sheets if we're talking about that particular pesticide. Please don't feel like you need to quickly hover over that and get that um, uh, you know, QR code on your phone. I always record, I'm recording right now. This will get be, this will be posted at the Metro Master Gardener YouTube channel. I encourage you all to go check that out. If you don't, know what that channel is, uh, just email me my information's at the end of this presentation and I'll give you that um, that link so that you can go there and then you can watch it, take your time, you can look up each of the publications um, and then do some reading and you feel a lot more confident in your skill set for treating pests organically. So let's start. Okay, so as I mentioned before, organic pesticides have been pretty popular. So there's some folks here, probably from Harvest Gwinnett, there's some master gardeners, and then we have some other gardeners and folks that probably want to use um, organic pesticides or are using organic pesticides in their garden and just wanna le learn a little bit more about them. Some people may know a lot about them. Some people may know almost nothing about them and, and they, you know, have to, to know a little bit more, or maybe they're just not using anything and they feel kind of stuck and would like some alternatives because maybe they're, they're seeing a lot of problems with insects in their gardens or fungus issues or, or, you know, a whole plethora of things, and they want something to use in their toolbox. So we'll break down the differences between organic and synthetic. And um, at the end, if there's a little bit of time, we can uh, do some Q&A. All right, so first and foremost, again, don't get worried. My slides are really busy. There's a lot of information on here, but again, you can check it out later. I just wanna put that information there because I'm gonna talk a lot and I also want that information available to you so that you can go back and take a look at it at your leisure and process it. Uh, so why do we need pesticides? Well, pesticides, um, because we have a lot of pests. We have bugs. We have fungal issues. We have, you know, 
weeds, we have diseases. I mean, there's all sorts of different things. And so that's what pesticides do. That's the broad category. Um, I'll give in a couple slides, it'll show you all the different types of things that fall under that pesticide cate uh, category. But <clears throat> ultimately pesticides were kind of invented back in the uh, um, you know mid-century, 1950s-ish time period. And they really raised productivity of, um, of crops by acre. As the population has increased, we farmers have had to get, you know, more and more, you know, uh, knowledgeable about how to treat crops and how to increase their productivity per acre. Um, and so that's what pesticides do, because obviously when you have um, insects and fungal issues and environment, being a farmer is really difficult. So um, also pesticides are going to safeguard human health by preventing food crops from being contaminated. A lot of times we're storing these crops and you don't want to lose a whole season's worth of, say, wheat or barley or some, some other type of staple uh, grain crop by losing it to having a fungal infection uh, because then it's not usable because a lot of those will create toxins. So how do we... Um, how do we know we have a problem? And so just skimming over the top of this, you'll see this triangle in the middle. Um, this is the disease triangle. And so in order to get that disease that you see in the middle in that pinkish reddish color, you have to have the right environment or the conducive environment. You have to have the pathogen and that can be the insect. That could be a fungal, um, that could be a virus, that could be anything. And then you have to have a susceptible host. And so you've got to have all of those things overlapping to provide the right conditions in order to get that disease. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, but again, that's just a very high level description of what this is, but the, it's it's valuable to understand that so that you, you know why we need those pesticides. Okay, so what is a pesticide? So that's gonna be chemicals, uh, that are in origin of plant, animal, or synthetic. It's manufactured for preventing, destroy, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. Um, it's going to be also a plant regulator, like a growth regulator, a defoliant. We use that on cotton or desiccant to help dry that out. Uh, the formulation you're gonna have both active ingredients and inert ingredients. So if you're a master gardener and you've taken the course, then you know at least some point in one of our courses, we've talked about how to look at that uh, pesticide label. And you'll see the active ingredient and the inert ingredients. And we always talk about pesticides with regard to that active ingredient or ingredients. Uh, that's how we identify the type of pesticide that we're dealing with. We don't talk about name brands. Um, we don't, I mean, although you can suggest them if that's the case, but we always talk about the active ingredient. In this case, the label that I have here is imidacloprid. Um, so you can see there that it's got 0.22%, and then you have your other inert ingredients that add up to about 99.78%. Um, so you can see below that, that a list of all the different types of pesticides that uh, are created that are out there. Um, ascaricides and miticides for mites um, and worms. You've got bactericides for bacteria, pesticides that kills fish, larvicides uh, for uh, beetle larva, fungicides, herbicides, plants, of course, plant growth regulators, um, insecticides for insects, molluscicides for mollusks, and nematicides, nematodes, rodenticides for mice and rats, and scalicides for scales. So you can see there's a lot of different subheadings here. And then there's just some factoids about testing and regulation of pesticides. So what is not a pesticide? Okay, so let's break that down. So fertilizers and substances used to promote plant growth and health when they're not combined with pesticides. So mycorrhizal fungi, um, that's actually used to help plants. It's like a symbiotic relationship and it helps them absorb more nutrients. And, and um, so they're a good thing. That doesn't include weed and feeds. We see a lot of those on the shelves. I tell a lot of people just, there are very special circumstances and where you would want to do a weed and feed. Um, and most times, 
it's not going to involve what your lawn needs or what your flowers need. What usually happens is you put a weed and feed out and the weeds get the nutrients and they grow bigger and not necessarily um, die like they're supposed to. So usually we try to break that down and do fertilization and pesticides in different treatments. Biological control agents, except for some microorganisms, that's going to be things like ladybugs, parasitoids, nematoids um, that eat pests. So biological controls, um, not including BT or Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, we plug that a lot for caterpillars and spinosad. Those are regulated as pesticides, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So what's a minimum risk pesticide? You're probably thinking, I just thought they were all pesticides. Well, the EPA does break that down into different classifications. So pesticides that pose very little risk to human health or environment have been exempted from the requirement that they're registered under the FIFRA Act. Um, if you wanna read more about that, you can hover over that QR code later on. Again, please just hold off on that because you'll miss a lot of information. This will be posted. You can go check that out uh, after it's posted on the YouTube channel. Products listed as minimum risk pesticides by the EPA are exempt. Uh, they don't have to have an EPA registration number and be labeled with name, weight percent of each active ingredient. Um, the name of each ingredient and some of the, those examples would be like castor oil, corn gluten meal, or citronella. So I just have a little citronella plant there. And uh, again, you can go hover over that if you want to look at that uh, FIFRA and the EPA. So what are synthetic and inorganic pesticides? So everybody who's, you know, wanting to be here to learn more about organic pesticides, but let's define what inorganic or synthetic pesticides are. <clears throat> so that's going to be a substance that is formulated or manufactured by a chemical process. Okay, so that chemically changes a substance that could be have been extracted from a, a naturally occurring plant, animal, or mineral source, but at this point now it is um, it has been chemically changed so that it falls under the synthetic category. So synthetic pesticides, as I mentioned before, uh, really kind of came into being in the 1930s. They were very widespread after World War II, and by 1950, pesticide use was found to really significantly increase um, farm yields. So there was no going back at that point, although there weren't a whole lot of, there, there was still a lot of unknowns. If anybody can remember back to DDT, that was something that had to be basically outlawed. Um, and we still have pesticides that are pulled from uh, rotation and use. We get an updated household manual so that we know all the different active ingredients. Um, we get those every year at Extension, and it gives us updates on what's been pulled, what's been added, that kind of thing, and all the relevant information so that we can talk to people and give them suggestions on what to use. Uh, just most people may also know that synthetic pesticides are also called conventional pesticides. So inorganic, synthetic, conventional. And um, some of them are going to meet the criteria for use in organic agriculture as well. Uh, one example would be like copper sulfate or uh, parasitic acid. So copper sulfate is, um, you know, copper is used as a nutrient. If you'd listened to my last presentation, you would know that's actually used as a, an ad additive uh, in the case where there's a copper deficiency. But copper sulfate can be used to kill moss. It can be used to kill algae in pond situations. So there's you know, a reason there why you would use it. It's a completely natural compound. Uh, you can see there, I do have um, a listing of organochlorines, organophosphates, carbamates, and pyrethroids. So those are just kind of a real abbreviated list of examples of those particular types of chemicals. You can see DDT uh, is in there, diazinon, um, carborol, uh, some of the pesticides that are no longer being used here in this country, and some of the effects that they can um, uh, have on on people and on mammals. And so that's the reason why a lot of people may want to uh, go organic. 
Okay, so what are organic pesticides and biopesticides now that we've defined the inorganic? Uh, so that's going to be pesticides that come from natural sources that, again, are not converted chemically. And those natural sources are plants like pyrethrins, uh, rotenone. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about each of these in detail um, later on in the presentation. Animals like uh, in synthetic insect pheromones. Bacteria like uh, Bacillus thermogensis or Bt, spinosad, uh, minerals, boric acid, diatomaceous earth, and they're not chemical free. So this is where we're going to kind of dive, do a deep dive so that you understand that just because it's organic does not mean it's 100% safe. Uh, you have to take this all with a grain of salt because it's still a chemical. It just may be a natural chemical. So the nice thing about most of these is that these chemicals typically are broken down pretty quickly by either microbes or by weather, UV radiation or dilution, that kind of thing. So they're not considered as toxic, as toxic as some synthetics because um, a lot of synthetic pesticides will have what we call persistence in the environment. And uh, persistence basically means that it hangs around for a longer time. Um, for instance, like uh, Roundup or glyphosate, that will break down in eh, like 40 to 80 days, give or take. So basically one whole growing season. So you kind of have that in the back of your head, whereas some of these, you know, 10 days, you know, give or take, it may break down. Um, and again, I just want to, and I'm going to keep hammering this home just because a product is considered organic or natural doesn't mean it's not toxic. Uh, some organic pesticides are actually more toxic than synthetics. And um, that's a very important point to, to bring up. And I'm going to, I will bring it up again and again, because we need to respect what we're using and we need to know how to use it. So that's why I'm trying to give you this toolbox. So again, here you can come back to this later. And there's an overview of some biopesticides. Uh, you can go take a look at that publication. Regulation of organic pesticides. So USDA is going to make determinations or distinctions in organic farming. Uh, if anybody here has ever had to do or wanted to do organic farming and looked into getting that certification, you will understand this is a very lengthy and difficult procedure. Uh, they make you jump through a lot of ho circus hoops to try to get this um, certification. So um, it is difficult. Just beware. If you want to read more about that, you can go check out that link. But what they're defining as synthetic, it's a substance that's formulated or manufactured by chemical process um, that chemically changes the substance from naturally occurring uh, plant, animal, or mineral sources. So again, biopesticides, man-made pheromones, um, and you know, again, I'm just trying to review some of these so that y'all understand it's a ton of information. Uh, so trying to review it periodically so that um, you know it can stick up here and the National Organic Program, that's going to give you USDA organic seal, and then OMRI, which that's your Organic Materials Review Institute, a nonprofit, and they're going to do an independent review of products like fertilizers, pest controls, livestock care products, and things like that. So they're kind of an independent review process. So origin does not dictate toxicity. As I've mentioned, uh, both organics and inorganics can be toxic, both to humans and to other mammals and, of course, your pests. So organic pesticides do have specific modes of action, just like synthetic pesticides. So um, we teach at Extension uh, people who are interested in getting their pesticide uh, licensing. So we have to go through a much deeper dive of all of this information, um, less so about the toolkit and how to use it, more so about all the safety um, parts of this and how to respect using a pesticide, whether it be a synthetic or an organic. Um, but mode of action basically describes that um, the key events that are taking place at a cellular or molecular level um, after that organism or that pest has or mammal has been exposed to the substance. Uh, and those can lead to functional or anatomical changes in the cells. So the EPA has come up with a way uh, to classify that using signal words. 
so just to kind of give you an, a little bit more um, background on the highlighted words, if it's an important word or phrase, I'm going to highlight it or bold it so that it stands out a little bit more. And I tend to do this in whatever I'm teaching. So um, in this case, signal words are important. And you can see in the little infographic off to the right, you got danger, which is high toxicity. Uh, you've got warning, moderate toxicity, and then caution, low toxicity. Um, and that's going to be for your active ingredients. And then you can see down here, I've got a little bit more, it goes into a little more, a bit more detail. So you can see extremely toxic, highly toxic, moderate, less. Um, and then the LD50, that's going to be uh, basic toxicity. Not going to go into that. If you're curious, hit me up after all of this. I will go into it. I've done some work with the EPA, so I can explain it a little bit more. But uh, just for layman's terms, that just you can as you're moving towards the red, that means it's getting more and more toxic and more and more deadly. So just keep that in mind. And then you'll see a label there. It's been circled so you can see caution, warning and danger. All right, so organic pesticides, are they toxic to pollinators? I know a lot of people who think, well, you know, we get a lot of people that call and our basis for being there is to educate folks. Uh, so a lot of people think that if they're using organic products that they're perfectly safe. And uh, this particular chart here kind of points out that no, there is a lot of toxicity to some of these organic pesticides. So you'll see on the uh, the left under pesticide, all the different types. This is not an all-inclusive list. It's just a sampling of different organic ingredients that are used for pesticides. You can see BT is in there, boric acid, diatomaceous earth. And then you can see the non-toxic, low toxicity and high toxicity. So you can see that um, you've got horticultural oil that can actually be highly toxic in certain situations. You can see pyrethrins, those can definitely be very toxic to pollinators. Uh, Rote known again, uh, sabadilla, spinosad, um, and copper sulfate can in certain instances. Uh, you can kill fish with that. Um, here in Georgia, we tend to have a uh, um, unbuffered water system. So we have a low pH in both soil and water usually uh, that tends towards acidic. It's not buffered very well. And so copper sulfate can actually be highly toxic to aquatic organisms. So little bits of trivia there. But um, so this is from the Xerxes Society and it's a really good publication. I just kind of did a screen grab on this. They've actually reworked this fact sheet. So you can see organic pesticides minimizing risks to pollinators and beneficial insects. I highly recommend going back later after this is posted and giving that a read so that you can understand how to use these. There's a reason why you might choose to spray after the sun goes down so that you're not affecting the pollinators um, because we don't wanna kill them. Obviously, they're the whole reason most people are trying to, to go organic in addition to trying to be healthier for your own self. Oh, sorry, I forgot the yes, but yes, they are toxic. <laughs> All right, Organic Pesticides and Integrated Pest Management or IPM. So IPM is something that we espouse at Extension. It's not something that you just use in your toolkit for organics. It is also something that you use in inorganics and everything else. Um, basically, you're going to have a set action threshold, a set of action thresholds. That's going to be a point where pest populations um, mean I got to do something. Like, you know, maybe the, the Mexican bean beetles have gotten out of control. You went on vacation, you came back, they've eaten your beans. Um, you know, so what are you going to do? You have to accept, figure out what are you going to accept as a level of damage? Um, and then make sure that when you get up to that level, that's when you start treating. Some people it might be a lot lower, some people it might be higher. Uh, so you just have to kind of figure that out for yourself. It means you're gonna be out in your garden a whole lot more monitoring and identifying pests. So you're gonna to have to flip leaves over. You're looking for eggs, you're looking for nymphs, you're looking for worms, all that fun stuff. So you, you need, if you're looking for a reason to get out in your garden more, here it is. You need to be much more involved in what you're doing. Prevention using cultural methods like crop rotation or pest resistant varieties of, of plants uh, so that your 
uh, well, pest resistant and like also fungal resistant um, to prevent pests from becoming a threat or ever getting to that threshold. And then control. So you're going to evaluate control methods for effectiveness and risk. Lots of people have a little notebook and they make all sorts of notes about what they did, saw in their garden, what kind of bugs were a problem. Uh, to go organic and to use IPM, you have to really pay attention to what's going. You have to do a deep dive and know a lot about insects and their habits and um, how to treat them. And you're really proactive. I think if there's one word to describe it, it would be proactive. You have to be very proactive about what you're doing if you're going to be using organics. Um, we all know that in organics, you can throw some of that on there and sometimes that'll kill stuff just like that. Um, but with organics, usually they're not quite as effective. And so you're trying to catch stages that die easier, like the nymphs in insects. And um, you just have to kind of know all of that. So again, that's why I'm giving you this toolbox so that you will know more. All right, so here's a little bit more about IPM. Uh, this is the IPM triangle, not to be confused with the disease triangle. This should come in very handy. You can see there are different stages or, or categories of IPM. You have cultural, physical or mechanical, biological, chemical, and up at the top, you, do, you can use synthetic pesticides. OK, they it allows for synthetic pesticides, but it's acknowledging the fact that you're trying all sorts of other things leading up to that. Um, and then your synthetic pesticides at the top of the, the pyramid, those are the last resort. So you can see cultural, your site, your plant selection, sanitation, rotation, <clears throat> physical or mechanical, insect traps and barriers, pulling weeds and getting those out of there, mulch tilling, pruning, flaming, uh, biological, getting some predators in there, parasites, uh, nematodes, things like that. And then moving into your organic pesticides, soaps, um, horticultural oils, baking soda repellents, insect growth regulators, microbials. And then up at the top, you're going to look at your conventional. So if you went away for two weeks on that awesome cruise uh, down into the Southern Caribbean and you came back and your garden's a mess, you know, you may decide, well, you know, if I'm going to salvage anything, I'm going to have to hit, to get the big guns. And so then you might want to go and hit that top most risky um, category. So why organic vegetable gardening? So that's going to ensure that the ecosystem is supported. That's probably the main reason most people want to do that. Um, again, it tends to break down quicker. There's positives for why you want to do it. Uh, organic food production. Um, it uses a lot of IPM. It kind of goes hand in hand, um, but it's going to limit your pesticides. So it's just natural rather than synthetic um, or taken to that next level. Broad spectrum synthetic pesticides can kill all sorts of stuff. So it kills the good bugs and the bad bugs, and it could injure you and pets and kids. And so while they're very valuable, if you know how to use them, a lot of people don't know how to use them. I, I run into people that think, oh, a little bit is good, more is better. No, that's not the case. Always follow labels. Um, that first and foremost, always follow labels. Know all the risks. So you have to be educated when you're using these. And then soil health is improved by adding natural components. And that's the case. So um, you're supporting the natural biome. Methods of organic pest control. We'll talk more about these. Uh, but maximizing soil health, uh, plant planting companion plants and to repel pests and using organic rather than synthetic, making DIY traps like st sticky traps for white flies, uh, installing row covers, so outsmarting them and handpicking insects. Sometimes you can play b-ball. I get the tennis racket out, you get the carpenter bees, um, although they are can be pollinators, so you, you know, mileage may vary, but you can smack the bees around. So, you know, try to make it fun or you pay your kids or grandkids uh, a dime for every leaf footed bug they pick off the tomatoes. I mean, there's all sorts of fun things that you can try to make it a little bit <laughs> better than, uh, you know, being out there in the 90 degree weather. 
you can um, practice crop rotation. Some of us, you know, if you have a really small area, that's harder to do, uh, but it is possible to do that. And what that does is that means that you don't have the same class or type of plant planted in the same place more than one year. So if you have pests that tend to favor brassicas or something like that, don't plant that there the next year. Um, avoid monoculture, use a lot of diverse crops because that's gonna confuse your pests. It'll also attract in beneficials. Choose seeds and transplants resistant to diseases. Make sure you water in the morning so that the leaves can dry out and that'll cut down on your fungal infections like powdery mildew. Make sure you don't automatically reach for organic or synthetic pesticides. A lot of bugs, you can just hose them right off. Um, spider mites, other small insects, if you ever have rose bushes and you see in June that the uh, leaves start looking like stained glass, that's the uh, rose sawfly. Those things, it's actually like a, a maggot, but they can't crawl back up. So if you hose it off, falls on the ground, it can't get back up there. And you just saved yourself uh, from pouring chemicals on the plant. And you can also use cardboard and metal collars as um, barriers if you have cutworms. So there's all sorts of different things. You just have to know the habits of that particular insect. Companion plants, uh, lots of reasons here. Attracting, confusing or repelling insects. You've got alliums in the um, garlic family, and that's going to repel Japanese beetles. Nasturtiums as a trap crop for squash bugs. Trap crops are crops that that insect pest prefer more than the vegetable or other thing that you're trying to grow. So in this case, those nasturtiums are going to attract those squash bugs and bean beetles more than whatever it is you're growing next to them. So if you know that and you're armed with that bit of information, you can plant the nasturtiums. They're pretty to look at and they'll attract the pests. Marigolds, those help repel those cabbage worms and some aphids. Celery helps repel some cabbage butterflies. Lavender, the scent. Uh, it's an essential oil. Often that'll confuse pests. Mint, make sure it's in a, uh, a container though, because it can be very invasive. Uh, that will, uh, that's another essential oil and it will repel some insects. Uh, calendula and uh, cosmos, those will attract beneficial insects like parasitic wasps, hoverflies, and things like that. Um, and so those actually will, they'll come in and um, parasitize some of the caterpillars and other things, and then dill, which will attract lady beetles. So here's some, in, uh, some examples of beneficial insects. So they can be pollinators or predators. So you've got a pirate bug. You'll see here that as I'm going through, the number is going to pop up next to it. So um, you'll see that. So pirate bug, there's a picture of one down there. They eat white flies, aphids, scale and thrips, uh, surfed flies or hover flies. Um, those do Japanese beetles, stink bugs, hornworms, uh, technid flies, like down there, and typha wasps. They're going to burrow into the ground and parasitize Japanese beetle grubs, aphidious wasps, um, aphids, braconid wasps, tomato hornworms, green lacewings. They actually are pretty predacious on a lot of different things. And ladybugs or lady beetles. Uh, I do not have the juvenile here for you to look at, but I do on another slide. So how to attract beneficial insects to your garden. Um, you're going to use a lot of diversity first and foremost. So varying heights and textures, natives, herbs, uh, a lot of interplanting. So, you know, it's kind of more of a riotous color than a planned garden. You're going to use different types of flowers um, to attract different types of pollinators. And ideally, you want something that's going to bloom all four seasons to support your pollinators. So like asters and dill are gonna attract those tachnid flies and ornamental pepper flowers for lace wings, assassin bugs and pirate bugs. And um, like the pirate bug, bugs prefer plants with tiny flowers like those crimson clover and oregano and um, then the dill and fennel for lace wings. All right, now it's moving on to organic pesticides. So now we're gonna start talking about some of the most heavily used types of organic pesticides. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. 
Uh, there is a lot of stuff on there that most people are probably never going to touch, but most of these are going to be your go-tos for your typical organic garden. <clears throat> so insecticidal soap, um, that is um, going to have to, you're going to have to use that. It's going to come in direct contact with the insect pest. Once it's dry, it's no longer effective. So it's a direct spray type situation. That soap is gonna penetrate that insect's cuticle. That cuticle is the hard exoskeleton on that insect. And it's gonna cause the cells to collapse and desiccation or drying out is gonna happen and suffocate that insect. And so an example would be scale. It's one of the safest organic pesticides that's out there and is non-toxic to animals. So there's no residue. It can be used on vegetables all the way up till harvest. Make just make sure you wash it off when you're in the kitchen. Uh, but just to note, it does not work on adult beetles and that's because their carapace or the exoskeleton is very, very thick. Um, so with a lot of these pesticides, you have to understand the best time to treat is generally when it's an, either an egg or a nymph, usually a nymph or a soft bodied uh, part of that life cycle. That's the easiest time to kill these pests. When you have a lot of adult pests, most of them are gonna have that very hard cuticle or exoskeleton, and that's gonna be a lot harder, almost impossible to kill. Diatomaceous earth, a lot of people swear by this. Um, please note that it only works when it's dry. So some people say they actually like to eat it. I mean, I've seen people say to use it on chickens. Um, if it's wet, it's not going to work. So, but this is a silica powder of fossilized diatoms. Uh, so it's it's fossils, ground up fossil, fossils. And it has very abrasive properties. So what you can use it for is, um, it, some people will use it for fleas. Some people use it in chicken coops for mites and things like that, soft bodied uh, insects. And it'll tear through their exoskeleton and then they dry out or dehydrate. Um, and it's um, somewhat useful in situations where you have an insect that has become a little resistant to types of insecticides, including organics, uh, because it's a physical mechanism. It's actually ripping through the exoskeleton, but it has really read up on, on what it will treat, I guess, before you hang your hat on it, because some things it's just not gonna work. For instance, a, an adult beetle, their carapace or the, the exoskeleton is just too hard. So um, make sure you read up on that. It is safe for uh, humans, but again, just like anything, any kind of a powder, you don't want to inhale that and get that into your lungs. So if you're going to be putting diatomaceous earth out and it's windy, it's a windy day, put a mask on. Um, you're supposed to be doing that anyway, using your PPEs, that's your protective, personal protective equipment. Um, that goes for inorganics or organics. You don't want to inhale that if you can possibly avoid that. So just make sure that you take care of, you know, wearing your protective eye gear, wearing your mask, wearing your gloves. Be careful, okay? Bacillus thuringiensis or BT, uh, lots of people use this. It has lots of uses. So um, BT is going to produce a protein that blocks the digestive system in the pest. It's typically used for caterpillars. Uh, so like cabbage, you know, moths and things like that. Um, and there are several different types. Okay, so understand that there are multiple types for different types of insects. You can see down at the bottom right, um, under the Missouri, Missouri Botanical Garden icon that that's common strains that home gardeners might use. Uh, again, check it out later. You don't need to do that. It'll take you to a publication where they list out all the different strains so that you know if you're trying to treat a particular insect pest, uh, which strain to use. So in this case, the insect has to directly eat that BT, its spores or the crystal toxins to work. And they all work kind of differently. So that crystal toxin is going to bind to that gut wall cell, and that's going to cause the cells to lice. Lice is a fancy word for break apart, uh, and that's going to lead to death in about two to five days. Uh, so again, as I mentioned before, BT is host specific for insects, so you have to identify what you have. 
If you don't know, take a picture of it and email it to us at Extension. We will identify that pest and then we will help you figure out what you need to get rid of it. Uh, it's not going to harm people, pets, birds, or bees. You can, this is what mosquito dunks are. So if you have some saucers that are out under your plants and you put your mosquito dunks in there and your cat drinks out of it, it's okay because that cat's not going to be harmed by this. It is slow acting, understand that, and it will wash away with rain. Uh, if you want to read more about it, you got the link down there on the bottom left to the National Pesticide Information Center for the fact sheet. Neem oil. So this is extracted from seed kernels in the neem tree, sprayed on leaves. It's good for soft-bodied insects like aphids, thrips, mealies, white flies. Um, but um, I guess the way it works, some people don't realize this, it's going to make that insect nauseated as it eats that. They actually have to eat it and basically turning them off food. So it, it works a couple different ways. So it's going to um, prevent the insects from going through their life stage by inhibiting an enzyme that allows them to molt out of that larval stage. So they're in kind of suspended animation. Um, it's got a lot of different uses. And, and so some may be familiar with one. In some case, here you have it can prevent powdery mildew. But again, as for any fungus, once it's there, it doesn't matter if it's a synthetic or an organic. If it's there already, you're not going to get rid of it. You have to put this on there as a preventative. Um, so you want to prevent germination and penetration of any fungal spores in that leaf tissue. So use it before. So if you know that suddenly it's gotten super humid and we've had a lot of rain, use it then because that'll help prevent the plants uh, from succumbing to fungal issues. It will wash away in rain and it is degraded by sunlight. As I'd mentioned before, uh, these organics tend to break down quicker. So that means you have to go back and reapply. It is safe for bees. Um, but not effective against caterpillars. That's, you know, we have BT for that. And, but you do want to make sure you're in a spray at the evening hours when those beneficial insects are not out. And if you want to check that out, you can check out the fact sheet there. Horticulture oils. Uh, so this is a refined petroleum product, generally mixed with water and sprayed on foliage. So it's going to coat and suffocate an insect uh, by blocking the sphericals. So I guess I could have put like a grasshopper on here. If you remember from science class, many of us had to dissect those. Those little holes on the sides of the insect's abdomen, those are sphericals and that's how they breathe. So basically you're just choking them to death, um, which if you have ever run over a fire ant mound with a lawnmower and cackled with glee, uh, this will be kind of similar to that, I guess. You can be like, ha ha ha, I just killed you by suffocation. Um, it's non-selective though, so it can kill other insects. So just be wary of when you're using it. Again, this is one you probably want to do after most of the pollinators uh, have, you know, gone away for the evening. This is going to be effective against most soft-bodied insects, and um, it can help trap fungal spores. So you know, just kind of keep that in the back of your head. Pyrethrins. You, it, this is derived from chrysanthemums and uh, is put out as a spray or dust. Uh, it affects the nervous system of insects. So again, pyrethrins, be very careful. Uh, pollinators are could be very susceptible to this. So you, this is not something you want to put out right in the middle of the day when bees are most active. Um, a lot of times they'll mix this with something else and that's becomes what we call a synergist, meaning it intensifies the behavior of the second chemical. Um, and they don't tend to be super toxic. They'll degrade within about a day. So their persistence is very low. That's a good thing. And they have very low toxicity to humans, but it can irritate your skin. And you can check out the fact sheet here if you want more info. Uh, Sabadilla, this is not one I'm super familiar with. It is highly toxic even though it is an organic, uh, only one company really makes it. And it's kind of a chemical of last uh, last on the list, something that I really wouldn't use unless you know I really needed to. It's got toxic alkaloids and um, it'll affect the nerve cells. So causing paralysis and death in insects. It can take a while or it can be pretty quickly kind of depending on the insect. 
Um, but again, it can also cause problems in human, humans. This is one where if you get it on your skin or you inhale it uh, or ingest it, you can get really sick. So, um, and it's also very toxic to pollinators. Use this one as an absolute last resort. Rote known, I mentioned this one before. Uh, so it is derived from roots. And uh, as a former fisheries biologist, we used this when we were doing fish surveys because it kills fish very effectively. So no, this is not something that is allowed under or the organics, the USDA organics. Uh, you can purchase it. It is available out there. I do not recommend it. And that's why I wanted to put it here so that you're aware. Um, it is sold as a miticide for cats uh, and dogs, I, I believe. So some people might know to source it there. I did want to let you know that, but it is highly toxic to um, domestic animals, specifically fish. If it gets into the water system, it will kill fish. Uh, you probably just want to cross this one off and not use it. Sulfur. Um, I mean, you know, this is pretty innocuous. It's good for preventing fungal spores. Um, you know, you get tomato blight. This is kind of your, in your toolbox, you use this pretty regularly. Uh, it is washed off uh, through rain, but tends to be pretty non-toxic, but it can be irritating to your eyes. Um, you know, but again, it's a good fungicide. So um, this one is is one that you probably are going to use pretty regularly. Uh, Spinosad, uh, this is made from the fermentation of soil bacteria, so, and it affects the science, the insect's nervous system and can lead to paralysis. It can take a while, um, and for the insect to die, um, and it can be kind of toxic to earthworms. After it's dried, it's safe for bees to be around, but again, you wanna probably put this out in early evening after the pollinators have kind of gone away. Um, it'll control caterpillars, beetles, and thrips, some of the caterpillars that aren't affected by um, BT. So just, uh, you know, just be wary of the limitations here and um, the dangers. All right, uh, moving on to common garden pests and their controls. We're running a little behind here, so I'm gonna to try to whiz through. If you need to drop off, that's okay. Uh, again, I will, uh, you can always hit me up and um, I will give you the link where you can go back and watch the rest of it. So I just have here, most insects are going to have either complete or metamorphosis or incomplete metamorphosis. It is not super important for you to do a deep dive into which other than just to know that an incomplete, they generally, the adults, the nymphs will look like tiny little versions of the adults after the egg. Whereas complete metamorphosis, it's got to go through the egg, larval, pupil, and adult stage like a butterfly does with the chrysalis. So aphids, uh, tiny pear-shaped in uh soft-bodied insects. You've got the little cornicles or those little tubular structures on there, and they like to suck the juices out of plants, and they love to leave behind honeydew. Uh, the ants like to milk them, and then you get to get the powdery mildew that grows on that honeydew, uh, so they can be really annoying, and they also have a very complex life cycle that involves parthenogenesis, uh, where no fertilization is needed during certain parts of the year. Um, again, I'm not doing a deep dive into that, but I did put their life cycle up there if you're interested and you can take a look at that. Uh, but there, you can control these guys by either using a, a jet of water to knock them off, horticulture oil, which will smother them, ladybugs, lady beetles will eat them, um, although yeah, really have to have, you can buy lady beetles on, uh, Amazon and put them out in the evening, um, and hope that they're there the next day, because every time I've tried it, they fly away, who knows where they're going. So I just wasted money, but it, you know, you never know, they might want to hang around. You can also try interplanting with things like cat mint chives and garlic to dissuade them. Cabbage worms. So the two major kinds are going to be your cabbage looper, which is like a little inchworm. It kind of inches them along like that. And then the imported cabbage worm, which is going to be that fat caterpillar down on the bottom. Um, 
and they're going to attack your brassicas like your cabbages and your broccolis and your kales. So you're probably going to see it more in fall and winter when you're growing those kinds of things. Uh, you're going to use uh, uh, row covers are a really good way uh, because you're basically putting a barrier up. The adults can't get to the plant to lay the eggs on there. Uh, so that's a good way. Hand picking and plunking them in soapy water and drowning them. Treating with BT. This is a great way to use BT. Um, planting trap, clock, trap crops such as alliums, nasturtiums, or herbs. And companion plants to repel like marigolds, coriander, dill, and fennel. And then having predators, attracting some predators, green lacewings, uh, bringing in those parasitic wasps to lay eggs so they uh, eat them from the inside out. Yellow jacket spiders, and they'll feel, feed on the eggs and larvae. Leaf miners. So it's not one particular uh, type of leaf miner. There's all sorts of, it's a stage. It's basically a life stage. Um, Clover, can I ask you not to use the um, annotate function on there? You're drawing on the screen. Um, so leaf miners are going to be soft flies, flies, beetles, and moths, and it's just a life stage. So it's this little maggot looking creature that kind of somehow finds a way to burrow in between the tissues on that leaf. Because of that, it's very difficult to control them with neem oil or any of those because it's got the protection of that leaf. So how you control it, cut off the leaves where the tunnels are so you're removing the insect off the plant. You can put floating row covers over the top to get prevent the adults from getting in there. Um, use uh, trap crops, planting herbs that are going to attract uh, predators or beneficial insects that'll control those leaf miners. And, um, you know, you can at certain points when they get large enough, use neem or spinosad. All right, cucumber beetles. So this is going to be a really bright yellow beetle with three black stripes on the carapace. That's the, um, the exoskeleton or the wing covers that's on the back of the beetle. Uh, and it's going to be, in this case, you've got two. You've got the spotted and you've got the stripes. So the adults are going to overwinter in soil. Uh, so here's where mulch can be your friend and you can uh, disturb or um, use some type of way of moving that soil around so you expose them to the elements. They're going to feed on cucumbers, melons, squash, pretty much all vegetables. And again, mulch so that they can't reach the soil to lay their eggs. So you can use those trap, sticky yellow traps. Um, that's more of a way to kind of tell how many you have. It'll get rid of some, not all of them. Uh, you can also try using essential oils like allspice or clove oil to repel neem oil, uh, spinosad, pyrethrins. And if you can attract mantids, you can also buy those on Amazon, but I can't guarantee if they're going to hang around your garden. Uh, below you see the life cycle. Flea beetles. So these are going to be these shiny black little insects that are hopping around, feeding on eggplants, peppers, potatoes, turnips, um, uh, so on, uh, those kinds of, of plants, but they can be found on other things. They're going to overwinter in garden debris, so make sure you're cleaning up uh, all that debris of from your, your dead annuals, your plants that you have, because that's going to get rid of where they're going to overwinter. So you can effectively get rid of the next year's first generation anyway. Uh, you can trap them with sticky yellow cards, as I mentioned, neem oil, pyrethrins, uh, spinosad, potted mint, uh, an essential oil. Uh, make sure you're potting it because it's invasive. You don't want it to be able to get out in your garden and take over. Oh, um, and I put here the uh, life cycle so you can kind of see how they, uh, uh, the larva hatch, pupation, and then the adults. All right, Mexican bean beetle. Um, so most of us have, if you have, um, for instance, bush beans or pole beans, usually by July, these guys have found your bean patch. And they have eaten the heck out of the leaves and it's usually late in the season. And at that point, pretty much you're just going to rip them up and get rid of them, right? Uh, so they're kind of, this one's a super fat one here in the lower 
picture that I've got, but you can see the damage that they'll do to your leaves. And then I've got uh, the top left is the life cycle. It's got all the different stages uh, all the way through the adult. And again, they overwinter in garden debris. So get rid of it, rake it up, burn it, do whatever you need to do to get it out of there so that if you had an infestation, you can get rid of it. Um, plant flowering herbs, cover your bean plants, uh, and you can use spinosad. And don't forget about lady beetles. Um, make sure you know what they look like. So this is a lady beetle larva that you can see in the bottom right, and then compare it to the bean beetle larva. So if you're not looking really closely, it could possibly be misidentified. So just be, you know, and those um, lady beetle larvae are actually beneficial. So make sure you know how to identify those. Leaf-footed bugs, if you've got tomatoes, you probably have these annoying things. Uh, they have a incomplete life cycle, so the nymphs look like small versions of the adults as they grow up, change color, that kind of thing. Uh, they suck the juices out of your plants. Uh, I always have problems with my tomatoes. They overwinter in garden debris again, so make sure you're practicing garden hygiene. Get rid of that stuff. Uh, insecticidal soap uh, for the nymphs, and then you can also use tris uh, trap crops. I use sunflowers and plant that in an area nearby, but far, far enough away, uh, sorghum, and they tend to be more attracted to those. So if you have a nice big sunflower head, uh, you will find that they will congregate on that. You might be able to knock them all into a bag and squish them and get rid of them. And then you've ended the life cycle for that year. Oops, cutworms. Um, so these are a problem with seedlings and they kind of form the C shape. You can see it in the top there. Uh, that's their hallmark if they form that C shape. So any type of seedling is susceptible. It's not just one particular type of, of plant, uh, but you can see the things that you can do protecting the base of the seedlings with home aluminum foil or toilet paper tubes, uh, get rid of the weeds, um, till things, till your garden so that you knock the, um, the worms up crop rotation, nematodes, BT, spinosad, pyrethrins, hort oils, and insecticidal soaps. And if you want more information on their life cycle and treatment, you can check out this Utah State uh, publication. Japanese beetles. Uh, if you got a Bermuda or Zoe Salon, you're probably going to call me in June when they pop up and you start getting dead spots. But these beetles will munch on all sorts of things. Um, they're very annoying. If you know their life cycle, you can treat for them before they become annoying. So you can see the life cycle down there. Um, this is when you want to treat with your grub treatment. And yes, in this case, it is going to be um, a granular treatment. And you basically put that in there. It gets watered in. You treat March to May when the grubs and the pupa are close enough up to the surface, uh, usually a couple inches, and it will kill the grubs. You can also use nematodes. Um, I did not, well, you've got milky spore there too, and that will take care of some of them. But they they are, if you, if you kill them at the right mm -hmm. stage, they will die, and then you won't have that problem going forward. But you have, this is where education comes in. You got to know the life cycle. Uh, they're easiest to treat when they're grubs, folks. Um, again, that soft-bodied stage. And these beetle traps, all you're going to do is attract them. So that's just a pheromone trap that'll bring in the males that does nothing with the females. So just kind of keep that in the back of your head. It's not going to do what you hope it's going to do. Squash bugs. Uh, so all of these little brown eggs on the undersides, this is where you're flipping those leaves over, squish them. These guys pierce and suck out the juice and they'll kill the leaf. Uh, they love to overwinter in that debris, that garden debris. So make sure that you're, again, cleaning it out. Neem oil, insecticidal soap, pyrethrins, um, all of that is a good uh, thing to use in your toolbox. White flies. A bigger problem in greenhouses, but you know, also problem in the garden, especially when you're bringing it back from from a big box store wherever you're buying them. Make sure you inspect that. That's probably the biggest thing. Don't want to bring them home to your environment. 
Um, they're usually hanging out in the underside of the leaves and um, they love sweet potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, all of that. And they're gonna suck the juices out of those leaves and the plant is gonna be stressed and it's not gonna do well and, it, and those leaves will eventually die. So they like to overwinter on their host plants or in tall weeds. So make sure that you're practicing garden cleanup. Uh, nymphs and eggs are more cold tolerant. So if you leave that stuff behind, they'll just hang out and then you'll get another generation the next year. So again, neem oil, insecticidal soap. Uh, you can use those sticky cards as a presence or absence. So that way, if you start seeing them, then you know you need to get in there and start treating more. That falls under the IPM heading with that threshold. Squash vine borer, uh, it's a red and black moth, winged moth. And that larva is going to be a vine borer. So you can see in the top left here that you've got some eggs. And then you see the healthy larva that's now in the stem of that. Once they get big like that, uh, you can take a hat pin and you can kill them by poking that hat pin through. And sometimes that will save your squash. But um, usually by the time they've gotten to that point, your plant's probably a total loss. The best thing to do, wrap those um, bases in aluminum foil and partially bury into the ground so that they can't get to it. And double check and look for those little eggs. Tomato hornworms. Uh, so, you know, there's a couple things here. You know, I mean, some people plant extra tomatoes and just let them do their thing. The moths are really cool. And I've actually taken the moths and fed them tomato leaves and allowed them to pupate and then fly away. It's kind of interesting to watch their life cycle, but um, you'll get parasitic wasps. So if you see the caterpillar on the top, uh, leave it because that's nature taking care of things. Uh, you can also hand pick those soapy water, uh, put them in soapy water. Chickens love them. Uh, BT will work and spinosad. And you can see the little wasp down below. That's what they look like. All right. Organic gospel for managing insects. I'm not gonna read all of these, we're running late, uh, but basically make sure you're getting out there scouting and looking. Uh, manage those populations early. It's earlier, the earlier you hit it and get rid of it, the better. You're not dealing with an infestation. Make sure you're looking at all those plants and encourage natural controls, including using flowers and herbs as trap crops to attract beneficial insects and other things. And um, use those row crops, use a barrier. Uh, get out there and hand pick those things. Use gloves if you're squeamish. Water spray, spray things away. Um, that works. And use chemical control sparingly, even organics, because that's not a, gonna eliminate all risks. Spot treat instead of using you know, a whole area, big area, and, um, you know, tolerate some damage. So, you know, we get used to what we see in the store where it's perfect, but in an organic world, you're not going to find that. And just know that organic fungicide options are very limited in their effectiveness, right? Practice good sanitation. I mentioned in quite a few of these, the life cycle, the insects overwinter in detritus in your garden. So if you rake that up, get rid of it. Conversely, in other areas, consider having what we call a beetle bank or let the leaf litter be so that you get the beneficial insects living there and dispose of those diseased plant materials promptly and get them off your property. So organic pest management, it's not simply replacing conventional pesticide with something labeled organic. It's gonna be integrated pest management. It's a whole bunch of different stuff. It's your toolkit. And it's gonna be different for each person, each garden and each situation because not everything responds differently. Uh, if you've got different environmental conditions, you may need a different set of rules for what you're gonna be doing. Knowledge and planning are the keys. As you saw, I, I went through stuff fast and I tried to give you some good information that you can use, um, go back and look at and use so that you, I guess, have a better grasp of what organics can and can't do for you. They are not the holy grail. Uh, just like some people think synthetics are the holy grail, they are not either. Uh, it is a whole host of different techniques to try to uh, battle mother nature, if you will. Um, beware of home remedies. You're going to see a lot of stuff on YouTube and other little garden articles where they're like, oh yeah, dump some 
vinegar and onions and some other stuff in a bottle of water and let it ferment and it'll kill everything. No, that's not the case. So understand the mechanisms for how stuff works, understand the life cycle and the easiest time to kill things and the thresholds. Um, disease and pest occurrence, it can be different, different regions. And so when you're looking online and we teach this to our master gardeners, make sure you understand what region you're in. And if you're looking at something from Maine or Minnesota, know that that may not be the same type of pest or situation down here in the Southeast. We have much different growing conditions than they do. And things that may not be a problem up there because it's cold in the winter time might be a problem down here because it's not. So just kind of keep that in mind. And the best thing to do, always look for .edu. So if you're looking at publications, you want that .edu, that comes from extension or university that's going to give you the best um, best information for all of it and with that that is the end of the presentation so if you want if you're new here and you haven't checked out our other classes we have a lot of classes here um, usually I do a couple a month uh, on all sorts of different stuff, you can uh, check out our website and that's where the events and classes are. This is me, take a snapshot of this. If you want, if you're not familiar with where the YouTube channel is, email me and I will give you the link for that. Um, we've got some chat here. So let's see, we're gonna go through that real quick cause I talked about 10 minutes over, too much information. Uh, which organic insecticide would you say is most effective against squash vine borers? Um, yeah, you know, again, what I'm, what I mentioned there is that it's going to be different for each situation, each garden, and it's not just one thing that's going to work. It's going to be a bunch of different things. That's why I keep referring to this toolbox. Uh, you're going to have to use garden sanitation. You're going to have to know the life cycle. Uh, you're going to have to know that if you put a mulch layer out there or you put, um, you know, cardboard or newspaper or something over the top to prevent that female from being able to get down there and lay eggs, uh, that helps short circuit it. Making sure you get all of that detritus out of there hitting them with an organic at the correct life stage. Scouting is key. You have to do that. Um, organics is not as easy as one would hope. There's a lot of steps that in, are involved in it, and it means a lot more effort. That's why organic produce is so much more expensive, folks. It's because you are putting a lot more manpower into how that, that produce is created. Um, a lot of times there's more damage uh, it's not as pretty to look at. So just kind of keep that. Um, there's not a holy grail. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> um, okay, so I don't send out um, the link. If you want the link, uh, take, a, take a snapshot of this with your phone or a screenshot on your computer. My email address is there and uh, just email me and ask for it and I'll send it there. I, I can't do that for everybody, I'm sorry. Um, let's see, I've been using carrot tops as green compost, digging it into the soil. Could that be attracting pests? Uh, not so much attracting pests as um, it's not fully broken down yet. If you're doing it too close to your plants, you could be doing some um, nitrogen sinking uh, where you've got bacteria that are breaking that down and may actually be robbing nitrogen from the plant. So make sure if you're going to do that, uh, do it off to the side away from that in the raised bed. That way it will return all those nutrients back to the soil, but it's far enough away that it's not going to be robbing it from the plant. Can you walk through some tips on sanitizing after a season? I've had some pest occurrence after and thought I disposed of everything the way I needed to. Um, it's okay. Don't worry about the, the drawing part. Um, sure. So after you've had a killing frost, after you're done with whatever you're growing in your garden and all of it is dead, uh, some people, if you're not subject to dealing with fire restrictions, some people will burn stuff in their garden 
Or if you rake it out, if you have a fire pit, that's a perfect place to put it. Rake all of that stuff out. At that point, if you can till that soil, you might want to till it or get a, a, a shovel and turn that soil over. And so if there are insects that are living in that top couple inches of soil, you're now exposing them to the elements. And so at that point, they're pretty much hibernating. They're not really active. So if do it right before a killing frost, before you know we're going to have a lot of cold weather, and you might knock your population back by 30 or 40 percent because you've flipped it over and, you know, now they're in the elements and they can't make it through. So um, know your weather, know when it's going to be wet, um, you know, use nature as a benefit to you. So, you know, get all of that stuff out, all of that detritus, burn it or bag it, um, get rid of it, get it off site. And then when you know that cold weather's coming, get out there and turn that soil over so that you expose everything and you can freeze it. Anybody else got anything? I think that's the last one. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we went over by a little bit, so I don't mind answering other questions. I know there's a ton of information here. Um, I'm, you know, trying to make it as usable as possible, you know, as, as much as I possibly can with regards to particular pests uh, and the most popular types of insecticides, um, pesticides that you might use. So I think we had um, maybe a new record. I saw like 30 people in here and that's fantastic. So we're trying to get the word out here. If you have a particular subject matter that you want more information on, you've got my email address. If you took a picture of that, um, you know, hit me up and let me know if you have something that you would like to see more about. And I'm happy to, to write that and get that out there. I did want to, I know my mom's not on this, Shirley Bohm. Um, she does help me a lot. She'll do an outline for me sometimes. Uh, and then I'll flesh everything out and add all the information. So I always like to uh, thank her when she's been kind enough to, to help me with an outline. And she did on this one and the last one. So basically that's it. So if you have any questions at all, you can email me uh, privately and or, you know, now before I, I end everything. But thank you all for coming. And uh, I appreciate you all. And, uh, you know, definitely check out some of the other classes. And um, everybody have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.